Thank you so much, Marianne. Beautiful. And so helpful. Such an invitation to the freedom of our sitting and to allow it to be expansive and investigative. Sometimes somehow it feels like uh, there's an instinct to hold our bodies, hold something, you know, in sitting. And this movement uh, is such an antidote to that. And then it becomes so clear how unnecessary. So. It really is remarkable to uh, be alive in these human bodies. And, you know, we all have, uh, I think, different levels of physical freedom and what we may, you know, physical limitations. And somehow I, I find, especially with this Qigong and these gentle movements that uh, those limitations, you know, oh, I'm this old, oh, I'm not that flexible or you know, this or that, they just sort of melt away, doesn't matter. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, I want to say just just thank you for the practice and and the beauty, and it also how it calls to mind um, Dogen saying to his monks, you know, you have the rare opportunity to be born in human form. Who would waste a spark from a flint stone? the spark, you know, sometimes that's interpreted, I mean, commonly to be the spark of our life, gone like that, out in a flash. But it's also, you know, moment to moment, every single sense gate, every spark, every breath, every gesture, that, there's the spark, you know. Lie on your back. Lift your arms gently above your head. Press your head gently into the ground. Feel that stretch. Every gesture. So welcoming and at the same time, spark from the Flintstone. So um, thanks all for your uh, sharing in it. Um, I have the feeling I may be using my own words to say some things that others might say right now. Um, but uh, please make yourselves comfortable for this. We're gonna now look at some of the questions that have been sent in. Dan? Okay. Um, this is on posture, so good segue. Sitting with the hips above the knees on the high cushion with legs crossed in front or on bench with feet pointed back, my feet and lower legs often fall asleep. Any tips? Yes. Um, I mean, experimenting is very helpful, but um, you know, usually if someone has... Um, long legs, in some cases, a little less flexibility, uh, it helps to have more height, certainly for, for long legs. Um, but it, I would experiment with the height of the cushion. But also, um, it can be when you cross your legs, um, if one leg is, 
you know, if you're not crossing just Burmese, this, what I'm about to suggest won't help that. But if there's, a, if there's something like this, either half lotus, quarter lotus, um, it can be helpful to have. Um, this is a, a little booster cushion. Um, I got online, they're widely available. I think this might've been from Dharma Crafts. They, they're not as widely available as just a regular mat and you know, huge varieties of um, cushions, zafus. But um, this has helped me. I sprained um, an ankle, sadly, some years ago and had always, or for a long time, I'd been sitting in half lotus and it felt so solid and I just didn't hurt. And lo and behold, that happened. That injury happened and I have not been able to sit since like that. But I, if I put this between, you know, under that ankle, between my legs, um, it prevents that numbness from setting in. It's just worth a try. Um, and the other thing is with a bench, it can be very helpful to really hang your feet off the back of the mat. So um, they're not, you know, having to be flat, but um, your toes and the bottom half of your feet, um, you're almost in able to be in a relaxed stand position with your feet. And I've noticed, um, you know, when I sit for um, hour and a half to, uh, it, it doesn't bother me, but I, if I don't have my feet, if I kneel for when I'm giving doksan for that long period of time, I mean, it can be three hours. And um, if I let my, the backs of my feet hang off, uh, I have a, I'm less asleep when I stand up. That said, it's, it's not necessarily a problem. It just means you have to be very mindful when you stand up because it's really possible to fall. Um, but I would try the, you know, when you're sitting front and knees down, see if you can find some kind of support cushion and play around with where the pressure point is that you could relieve and uh, otherwise hanging the feet off the back worth a try. Okay. Okay, um, how, how much do the four day retreats differ from intro introduction retreat? Ah, uh, thank you for that. Um, I actually hear this question from two angles. First of all, just straightforward. Um, the four day retreats, actually the main block of the day looks, the schedule's very much like what we've been doing for these two days, except that there's no introduction to posture. Uh, there's no introduction to what is a retreat, uh, what is a Dharma talk, um, but there are, uh, you know, it's sitting with a, a Dharma talk every morning and a Q&A every afternoon. Um, in addition, for those four day retreats, uh, there's a two hour block of sitting early in the morning that um, often is led by Bernd over in Germany because for him it's early afternoon, but a lot of people join that. Of course, on Zoom, it's optional, but uh, you, know, you have that chance to sit from six to eight mountain time in the morning. And then you know, we have movement at 8.45 each day. And then the main block of the day ends at 3.30. These are mountain time. And then in the evening, 6.30 to 8.20 again is a, a sitting, you know, with a jiki. And at the end of the day, um, the recitation of the four vows. Because we're virtual, um, you know, it's all, you can pace yourself. So anyone who has done one of these retreats could freely join a four day retreat. And, and just, you know, pace yourself. Um, the other side that I hear in this question is, um, gosh, is this really an intro retreat? Or did I just get dropped off in the deep water, you know, like the deep end? Um, 
And every time I wonder about that, part of why I feel the freedom to give us this sort of plunge in and, you know, there are these, the first talk is really introductory and there are these points of introduction. Um, but uh, the Mountain Cloud website is, has this intro zone that is a very good resource. Uh, and, you know, it, for reading, there are these short meditations that are guided. There are, um, you know, podcasts by Henry uh, that cover all, all of these basics. Uh, you don't have to have done that to do an intro retreat, but uh, it means that it's available. And so I feel freer when I'm doing this to um, just kind of launch in. Um, where I wonder is this talk, for example, today, which was um, not really other than a than just a, a Taisho, a Dharma talk, um, understanding that if someone is new to this tradition, so much of this would have just been not really comprehensible. You know, taking up a koan and talking about the fan jumping up to the heavens or, you know, even form is emptiness, emptiness is form, the Heart Sutra, the Kanon, Kanzeon Sutra, all of that. I really believe it, it's okay. Um, so many talks over the years where I, uh, even, I, I mean, going to a retreat where the talk is in Japanese. I don't speak Japanese. And still something would come and it just didn't matter. So, um, you know, this is, this is a bit of an apology for uh, offering an intro retreat that includes, that is basically just a two day retreat. Um, we do offer weekly intro classes. And a couple of you mentioned that, um, and those are posted on the website. Uh, and, you know, some people will do them week after week and find that helpful. Um, I, you know, ne you never know, but there's the basic difference between this two day and the four day. Um, more sitting is available and the talks might go, um, you know, even more deeply into the tradition than I have. Uh, you never know. I hope you'll come again. Dan. Uh, you mentioned being a classical musician. Any thought of how this teaching could be manifested in art or even mundane daily tasks? Yeah. Being, uh, I was a professional classical musician in my first career for you know, a good 20 years and trained for that. And that's how I found Zen. Um, briefly, I was preparing for an audition. Uh, it, was, it was a position that I had played. I had won a regional audition, sort of statewide audition and played for a year and then, uh, you know, the union contract, which I really respect, said, got to have a national audition. So automatically in the finals and, you know, three months to prepare. And it was just like training for the Olympics. You know, that was basically my life, uh, plus the other playing that I was doing. But um, as that date of the audition drew near, I realized you know, I was waking up in the night and sort of revisiting past, you know, what, what I would have, what stung like failures or disappointments, you might say. And then during the day, practicing, training, so that I could play this way at a certain point in the future. And the past and the future seemed like these tectonic plates that were just separating. And where the present moment would be, there was this chasm. 
and I was losing my love for playing. So, um, you know, the week before the audition, I uh, played with the Dallas Symphony. I, I often did that whenever they needed a, a fourth flutist or a sub and um, asked a friend, you know, our friend asked me, how are you? Uh, and I said, well, something needs to change and briefly told this. And they, this dear friend, been in the orchestra for years said, oh, I've got just the thing, come and sit. And lo and behold, he had found this thriving Zen center in of all places, Dallas, Texas. And he'd been sitting for about six months. Um, so the audition happened and the next, you know, that was on a Saturday, Monday night, I was at the first intro Wednesday back for the second, Saturday back to sit, just even though I had never, I mean, I had some, you know, I had read like the three pillars of Zen in college, but it just felt like coming home. So then, you know, immediately plunging into practice, all kinds of monkey mind, what everybody struggles with, um, but, it was so clear, even on those dizzying sittings, <laughs> you know, I would then get in my car to drive home and somehow things were more clear. The street signs, there was just a, a translucent quality. Um, things gradually became uh, more still, more beautiful, more less covered. And, uh, this longing for authenticity, which I think had been there before even music perhaps, but, but how it expressed itself was just this deep desire to play without any pretense. Um, in music, we, uh, I, I think performing arts, um, this judging mind that all of us suffer, I hear about it so often, that inner critic, it's cultivated. You know, you are listening like a hawk critically to yourself all the time. And the, you know, that can be a great training, but it can, it also just, um, creates this separation. You know, you're always watching, always judging. And uh, I think there are really other ways to um, practice creatively and constructively, um, you know, to make, to partner more with that. Watching, um, witnessing. That, that attending, having, having it be more like how we attend in sitting. Um, but even more, what began to happen out of my sitting was the, the distance between player and played. I, I was a flutist. So this making the sound and the sound, hearer and heard that started to dissolve. And lo and behold, you know, out of this practice, it just fell away. I, uh, I mean, it's such a joy. Uh, that's one example. Uh, Another a way that this um, translates, I think, to everyday life is through this, you know, sort of wise question that the tradition offers is who is doing this? You know, as simple as who is walking? Who is cooking dinner? You know, who, who is typing? Who is taking a shower? I mean, whatever it is, um, that same kind of distance, that sense of separation, as if there's, as if there are two. 
that really can dissolve. Uh, and it's, it's so freeing. It's such a joy. Uh, and then, you know, this, this judging mind that we are, are so inured to turning on ourselves. You know, there's, you can read about this. There's a negativity bias even. So we remember the stuff that we think is critical and tend to forget whatever was good. Um, but this activity is going on all the time. You know, just, just watching, measuring, judging. And you cannot judge yourself without judging others. And in the same token, every time you judge another person, you're judging yourself. What a way to live. <laughs> Utterly unnecessary, such, I mean, we, you know, it's, it's just delusive. We say, well, we get all entangled in this, we bind ourselves, it's actually not, there's nothing binding us, but that's our experience, you know, of being bound, being judged of being kind of held up to a standard either by society or by ourselves. And um, wow, when you break through that, you have the freedom to live in, you know, in authenticity and integrity and simplicity. Um, so I am very grateful to have come to Zen from this experience in the arts. And I, I think that there are other I mean, there are many, many gates. Uh, it's just the most natural to me to imagine, you know, painting, drawing, looking through a lens, um, just interacting with beauty, with sound. Um, you know, I, I have this dear friend, Migaku Sato, who said, um, I've said this before, it's just stuck with me. We, he, he said once, just rather out of the blue, people these days cannot tolerate beauty. And then the conversation went on. And so, you know, this sort of went in and I later I'm like, well, why is that? You know, it, it, I, what came to me is that really to really see beauty, to be struck, taken in, absorbed by this, you disappear. In a sense, your separate self can't survive that. And we defend against that. So, but mathematics or literature or anything you do with your hands, construction. Uh, I mean, there's no, there's no limit to how this um, absorption uh, functions. It's so freeing and really very beautiful. Uh, there's this translation I mentioned earlier today of uh, the Kanzeon Sutra, the very famous sutra about Kanon, this great bodhisattva of compassion. And um, years ago, um, Hogan Bay's Roshi co-abbot at Great Vow Monasteries and Monastery out in Oregon, um, he, he wrote another translation. He just It's the same Canon Sutra, Kanzeon Sutra, but it's a little freer because he just felt like somehow the compassion that is just pouring out of that sutra, we were missing something in it. And so he, you know, I really like this. He wrote Boundless Compassion as the title. And the first line is absorbing world sounds awakens a Buddha right here. Yeah, that not to. And that can happen in our practice off the cushion, whatever you're doing. Okay. Um, oh, well, hopefully Rebecca got her volume back. I see a question. Great. Very good. Um, next question. Sometimes I feel like touching silence might not be very desirable. It feels a bit scary and I'm worried it might lead me to become more disconnected and inwards rather than the more connected. 
At other times, I can see that it would be very liberating. Sorry about this lack of question in this question. <laughs> uh, thank you, really. Uh, and I think we all hear a question. Um, I remember growing up and, you know, TM and meditation, and we're all taking over, and Zen was coming into the West in a way that it was being more widely available. And, uh, you know, people who criticized it, who hadn't really necessarily investigated it, called it navel gazing. You know, sort of escaping, this turning in on yourself, uh, taking refuge. And in this question, there's also the concern of um, maybe having, you know, already an, an, um, a natural tendency toward introversion and being letting oneself become withdrawn. Um, I am a, a natural introvert. Uh, and so this is just speaking from experience, um, getting very, very quiet has a way of uh, dissolving, untangling, helping us see through our narrative, our stories, whatever they are. And um, so I think if you come to Zen with a tendency toward introversion, this is just my, my experience, my sense, you're actually gonna find um, yourself more open to real relationships and um, more disposed to doing what is yours to do in the world. I mean, if, if I were exhibit A, I mean, which I, I don't claim to be, but I was totally surprised by what happened. Um, you know, I was a happy professional musician and, a, and that's a nice thing to do if you're an introvert because you spend you know, most of the day alone practicing. Um, then you go perform, you do this thing, you rehearse. Anyway, and one day I got up off my cushion and heard myself say out loud, I think I'll go back to school. Oh, really? <laughs> you know? And there was this impetus, this impulse that came from practice to want to address the world, um, do what I can in this case uh, to teach the Dharma. And I felt that going back and getting, in my case, I, I, I got a master's of theological studies because I, I had grown up as a progress, pro, my home was just a progressive Protestant context and, um, you know, there, there wasn't a critique of mysticism, but there was none of that present. And um, I just thought, wow, Christians, like of the ilk that I knew, they need this. There's just nothing, you know, it, it's, you actually start reading the Desert Fathers and Mothers or, you know, the same thing in, in Judaism, Hinduism, you know, look at Rumi, um, you know, Islam. Um, it's there, but it's so removed from most of us. So I just thought I'm going to, I don't know, I couldn't believe it. I applied to graduate school and I, I did that. And then one thing led to another and I stayed and did a PhD in Hebrew Bible of all things. I mean, the literary construction of meaning and you know feminist criticism and post-colonial criticism and all of this reading on the margins and, and somehow how, how Zen just, was able for me to uh, pair with that. Uh, so, yeah, this is this is just a story. I think there maybe it's answering another question, but um, I believe that this practice brings us to a phrase that I really uh, really appreciate. It's 
a funny story I may not tell now, but the phrase is fearless humility. There's a line in the Heart Sutra, no hindrance of mind, therefore no fear. You know, this hindrance of mind, we, th this pointing to this wide open, nothing impinging on anything, you know, that world, that, I mean, I think it's, it's the truth, but it's the vision of that sutra. And uh, so, you know, out of that, where would there be any fear, but, but this humility of things just as they are. And, and fearless is also, you know, that little I, me, mine I talked about earlier just gets out of the way. Um, so whether you're introvert or extrovert, that operates in this practice. There's just a way that being willing to cultivate stillness in a with constancy, humility, compassion. I, I think that our worries are stories. And if it weren't that one, there'd be something else. There'd be another way to frame it. Um, there's this lovely line in Mumon's commentary on Mu um, that I mentioned while we were sitting, it just came up that, you know, inside and outside become a single tissue. So this question actually beautifully follows along in Dogen's instructions. You know, he says, take the backward step and shine the light inward. So that is definitely collecting ourselves, governing the mind. It's a solitary practice in a sense. I, in a sense, it's solitary. But from that, turning the light inward, you see through and that sense of boundary, you see through that. So then there's the tendency, I mean, to want to serve, want to live in the world in a way that's fitting for you to find what's yours to do. So I, I feel there's a kind of innate activism built into this but it does require a constancy of this sitting. Okay. Um, I'm curious to know about the nature of your pivot of attention from professional musician to Zen teacher. <laughs> Would you be open to describing what that was like for you? Yeah, thank you. I, I caught a glimpse of that question and so um, realized I was just sort of speaking to that. Um, I mean, I spoke to the pivot from musician to, of all things, you know, graduate student. And um, then my life took a turn. I mean, all through grad school, uh, which took for those two degrees, the master's and the PhD. That was a long haul, eight years or so, because uh, I was, well, it can be anyway. And um, I continued to play professionally in and around all of that. Um, somehow it was possible. Uh, but then just as I, as it ended, and they're like, oh, now what do I do? Um, my life had one of those interrupts that uh, you know, we speak of that word often, it'll put somebody's feet on the path. Um, 
as it turned out, um, this unthinkable. Uh, I had been, you know, really happily married for well over two decades to um, to a wonderful classical musician. So you know, our lives were just shared all around that. And uh, when I went back to school, that challenged it. And Zen practice, where I was, I was quite committed, and I, you know, I somehow was able, to, I mean, thanks in part to family support, my husband even, um, at the time, I went to, I probably did six or seven sessions a year in person. You know, there would be four here and then I'd travel. Um, so I got to the end of grad school and very gently, if you can, ever do it gently, got a divorce. And suddenly, um, you know, in our culture, wow. I mean, I had, I had plenty of playing, but I didn't have benefits. And um, so, I mean, the doors just opened. I, I, I was, you know, heart goes out to folks in this uh, position. And so often it's women but for me at that very time, there came an opening in the school that had just given me this degree with honors. And uh, I applied and so for 11 years, I worked at the grad school then. Um, all the while deep into practice, um, and for part of that time still play professionally, but you can't, can't stay in shape. So the pivot to teaching um, in 2003, my teacher here in uh, Dallas, Ruben Habito Roshi, invited me to attend the first annual um, Kenshukai, which is a a week long intensive meeting of advanced students at that time, we were gonna be generation two, two A, we got that title. And um, we met somewhere in the world for a week and had this, you know, intensive public koan study with uh, the abbot of Sambo Zen and face-to-face uh, -face meeting with him every day and sitting every day it was, you know, and um, at the end of that first week, he appointed me an assistant teacher in Sambo Zen. There is a, there's a very clear path to teaching in this tradition, uh, and it is well checked. Um, I remember at that time, he said uh, to us, there were a few of us there, he had selected in that particular meeting. It happens at the end of every, every year, new people are appointed. Um, he said, you know, congratulations. And then if you think for a moment, this is anything, I'll take it away from you. <laughs> so great. You know, and at that time I thought um, he was, saying, you know, if, if I see you, you know, somehow not living up to this or having a stink of Zen or something, I'm gonna, you know, take you off the list. No, I mean, could have, but there is this innate thing that if for a moment you think this is something, it's just not, it's nothing, you know, and it, there's a self-corrective thing that has just been such a gift. Um, again, this humility and, and the fearless with that humility. I mean, it's not humility like I'm low, it's just things as they are, you know? And I, you know, I remember feeling uh, very insecure and unsure and like I had these fantastic teachers I'll never be able to do that. 
never in a million years. And uh, about a year after I, this meeting, we were in session, you know, Ruben was leading it. And along about the third day, I met him, I think it was morning for Dok San face-to-face -face interview. And he said, I want you to give the talk tomorrow. <laughs> I said, no, please, you know, I'm not ready, don't ask this. And he said, I want you to do it. So I did. <laughs> and uh, I don't, you know, that's, that's the pivot. A year later, um, that meeting was in China at Joshu's temple in 2005. And Rion Roshi appointed a small group again teacher. So that's the next step. And uh, uh, that was such a, a remarkable gift. Uh, you know, something comes in that is just not a matter of can I do this or can't I do this. It's the Dharma. And it's an incomparable gift. And you know, some years later, I was then promoted to associate Zen master and um, then invited to teach. I mean, I was teaching in Florida and then various places and, you know, it just unfolded. Uh, it's the most, most organic thing I've ever done. And um, for all of one's failings and the masters say this in the tradition, even it's unbelievable. These great masters will finish. This is in the koans, like a three month ongo leading the, you know, the intense period of practice for the monks. And, you know, there, did I do okay? Did I hurt anybody? You know, amazing. It's great teaching. So it's just out of your hands. And uh, even though that happens a lot, like, oh boy, I hope somebody got something out of that. Um, in the moment, that's that's not happening. And uh, I, I was a I had to really struggle with performance anxiety as a musician. I loved it so much. And any sane person who had that kind of biological response, <laughs> that fight or flight response, <laughs> you know, that just you know, ten times the adrenaline that you need to do something would never have gone into professional music, but I loved it. So I just toughed it out, you know, for years and finally learned, you know, how to play thanks to Zen, frankly, without just being terrified. I it just, it, it somehow finally happened, you know, to be so absorbed in something that you're not separated from it and therefore there's this whole part of you that can be scared. Uh, so music was full of that, but this, this teaching has not been. Uh, it's, it's the only thing I've ever done that for weal or woe, no matter how it goes, it's, it's a gift. So thank you so much for... Uh, the gift of your questions and sharing in this. And I really hope that um, it's helpful. And, you know, if this is a path for you that you can plant a practice, or if this is your practice, uh, you know, may it continue to deepen so that uh, we can all give ourselves to this world and it's in such need. Thanks. Well, let's take just a couple minutes, Dan, maybe, and um, 
Maybe stop the sit at about 25 after so we have a chance to uh, greet each other. Thanks. <laughs>